Welcome to the Space Between Podcast here. Um, I'm your host, co-host, excuse me, Jossie Cunningham, here with the beautiful, wonderful Tage, and here with Joey Natolo, hey, um, my co-host. Um, and this morning, I am esteemed to be here with Tage. Um, and we just want to ask you where you're from, uh, and uh, how did you come actually to California? Do you want to know that? Yeah, I do want to know that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, I'll tell you. I was born in Illinois at a college town when the parents were, uh, you know, the, ma the father was going through college to get a, a master's in chemical engineering. Then they moved to Michigan, and he got a Ph.D. You know, in s engineering. And then we moved to Texas, and he got his first oil job because he knew how to tell oil companies how to drill for oil. And then he moved to Southern California, several locations, and then they got divorced, which happens all the time, doesn't it now? In those days it didn't happen, so it was always embarrassing to me as a kid because nobody was getting divorced yet. Mm. And then the next thing that happened was he, l he moved up to San Rafael, Marin County, and I asked if I could come there because it was a horrible situation with the mother. She was a bad alcoholic. I thought I was escaping, but I was escaping into another type of hell. Those parents were like, something wrong with them. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I always feel like parents, sometimes parents are just, the only reason they're born is to make your life miserable so you'll grow up and face whatever it is that you have to face and grow into. So then they moved to somewhere else in Northern California called mountainside and then they moved over to connecticut a couple of places and then to colorado a couple of places and then i went down to louisiana to live with the mother for a little while and then finally my dad came to usc to get a job there he was a professor in petroleum engineering and then they gave me free tuition because of that can you believe it <laughs> so I, I went there and then i thought as soon as I get out of here, I'm leaving because it was 113 degrees when we drove in. Can you imagine? There was like hardly any air c control on emissions at that time. It was in the early 70s. It was so polluted. <laughs> you couldn't even, I didn't even know there were mountains down the street. I was shocked when it cleared up and I saw them. It's totally polluted in the middle of a ghetto, burning hot fire, and I get dropped off at the door. How old were you leaves. at this time? About 17? Yeah, 17. So I stayed there thinking as soon as I got out of college, I was leaving. I was going to be out of here. And then all of a sudden, I met my teacher, Yogi Bhajan, when I was like 18 and a half, 19, and I couldn't leave. Like it's once in a lifetime you're allowed to meet your teacher. That's what they say in the scriptures. Mm -hmm. And they say you either can recognize him or turn your back and walk away. But I knew that was my teacher. I went like, okay, that's my teacher. I'm staying. How There's did you know that that was your teacher? Okay. So, the fr you know, I told this story once before on another podcast. You know, they, I, was, I was studying psychology, which most people that are screwed up and they're trying to figure their head out, they go into psychology as a major, <laughs> don't they? Yeah, that's true. So I was studying psychology, and I was thinking, this, like, none of this stuff makes any sense. Nothing's helping me. So I saw a sign on a phone pole, and it said, yoga as a form of therapy. And that was like, take this little phone number. So, so like, the, like the pull things that you actually see on the phone booth, the, that's what it was? Yeah, and it, it, so I pulled it down, and, and yeah. I went into the classroom, and it, there was a guy there who was leading social psychology class. And it was like Mr. Handsome. All the girls were trying to chase him. And he starts going, you know, and he, I know he knew nothing about this. He wasn't like a practitioner. He was just like a hot shot. So he's just trying to get girls, you know. <laughs> so he starts talking about how Buddhist monks and Tibetan monks, they'll meditate, and then they can move stuff with their brain, with their mind, with their eyesight. And I thought, I'm going to do that. <laughs> So <laughs> exactly. I, I looked at that paper and I thought, okay, I'm calling. You know, yoga is a form of therapy. I thought, oh, I'm going to try this. So I called the guy up and it turned out to be some guy named Stephen. And I've known him. I know who he is. And he was in the education department. He was getting a PhD. And he was actually working with Guru Charan Singh, who was the head of KRI at that time, Kundalini Research Institute, that published all the early teachings. And they were doing a, a study to show that your self-esteem can change and improve when you take kundalini yoga classes. 
And I thought it was a really interesting experiment because he took a personality inventory test, which is a standard test, and then he went and gave half the group a three-month kundalini yoga class four hours on a Wednesday night from 6 to 10. And so I signed up for it. I had no car. There were no Ubers. You can't take a bus at that time of night from USC over to Proust Road where the ashram was. And I'd never seen a Sikh before. I didn't know any of this stuff. And so that night, a lady just dropped me off at the ashram quarter to six. And I get out and I look and I saw all these people walking in and out with big floppy turbans and clothes. And I went, holy crap. <laughs> They're going to try to convert me. This is a cult. I got to get out of here. Now, I don't know why. What a dingbat. I had no money. I didn't have a purse. There were no taxis that you could call. I didn't even have a dime for the, the pay phone. So I walked in the ashram, which I didn't even know what it was. And I look at the girl who's taking registration, and I said, I need a ride home. And she just looks at me <laughs> kind of shocked. And she goes, well, go back and ask the teacher. He's praying at the altar back there. Go ask him. So I walked in, and I'm waiting, and he's like five or six feet from me, and he's praying. He has his turban on. I've never seen anybody like him before. I'm really, really, really upset. I'm going, blah, 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 blah. i got to get out of here. When I come here, and I can't believe it, blah, 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 blah. And my mind's going a mile a minute, like all this stuff. And he turns around, very peaceful, and he sees me, and something comes out of the sky, hits me in the face really hard. And I was so stunned, I couldn't talk. So all that, he goes, yes, hmm. may I help you? And I'm like, uh, uh, that's what came out of my mouth. <laughs> <laughs> and then he goes, yes. He kept saying it. He was so, I would not be that peaceful with somebody. Yes, may I help you? He kept saying it like 10 times. He said it. Finally, I just said, I need a ride home. And he goes, oh, yes. We'll ask the class at the end of the class. They'll be very receptive then. And then he walks away. And I'm like, oh, my God, i got to stay. <laughs> <laughs> that was my introduction to the Dharma, to Kundalini, to my teacher. Because I, later I knew my teacher did it. I knew. Mm -hmm. I knew he knew that I was coming. I knew he knew that I had prepared lifetimes for this. I know, knew he knew I had a, a place in this group and I had stuff to do which, you know, it took a while to, like, unfold. I knew he knew I had to get healed from all the childhood stuff, and I knew that he set the whole thing up. That's how I feel about it. Did you know, when did you feel that you wanted to be a teacher? When did that hit you? Well, there were many steps along the way. I mean, first, you know, I met him physically in a lecture, and that was also really interesting because he walked up in the middle of a lecture he was about to give, and he just stood there and stared at me. And I w everybody was dressed in white. And I had navy blue clothes on and hippie hair, blue jeans, you know. And he was staring at me. And I, I was looking at him. I said, I don't know what you represent. I don't know who you are. But I'm going to listen to you. I'm going to decide if I'm going to follow you. We'll see. And he shook his head like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, <laughs> mm-hmm. He walked up. He taught. He sat on the teacher's bench. And then when he was done, and the whole time he's talking, I'm like, I agree with that. I agree with that. Mm -hmm, that makes sense. Yes, I agree with that. So then he came back, and he stood in the same place, and he just stared at me again. It was like kind of like he was saying, what do you think? <laughs> <laughs> and so I, I said, mentally, this is all mental. I said, I like what you said. I agree with you. I'll follow the teachings, but I'm not going to follow you as a man. Never will I follow you as a man. I will follow the teachings. And he looked at me, he goes, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And then he walked out. That was our introduction. Pretty cool, huh? Yeah, that is pretty cool. Yeah. yeah. And I don't even know how, I mean, being as emotional as I was, you know, having moved everywhere, and I had just come from Colorado, and I was just seeing these people looking so strange. That was the first time I saw anything like that, because I was like a really sheltered, innocent little girl. There was no internet then. You know, there was nothing that you could compare with. Now, everything, you see everything on the internet, don't you? Yeah. It's like sure. nothing's hidden anymore. But having, s like, looked at him, I thought, later, I thought, how did I have the guts? Even though I knew it was psychic, I knew it was a conversation mentally, 
I thought, how did I have the guts to talk to him like that? And then I realized this is like soul talk. And then I started thinking about it. Everybody has soul talk in them. Everybody. Everybody has a wisdom that you know is there, and everybody can access it. It's just whether you choose to or not. So true. That is very true. And, and you know, I asked you earlier about the fact that there's a wall up, I think, in the, in, in the Western world towards Kundalini as far as people see it, and they're like, oh, no, the turbans and this and that, and, they can, and, and there's this quick judgment of it. Um, why do you think that is? You know, what do you think the the gap is um, there between what the world fears and what's actual really happening? Um, well, I was driving uh, here, and they had a story on the radio. I always listen to talk radio because it grounds me. That's mm -hmm. why. And plus, it, it tells you stuff, you know, what's going on. And I think it's really important for us to know, to hear different opinions. But they were talking about some man that converted to being you know, an Allah follower. So that makes him Muslim, right? Mm -hmm. So he was like a young kid, 18. And this is in like be right before 2000. And when, when was 2000, uh, 9, 11? 2011. When one? No, 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 excuse me. 2001, 2001. Yeah. yeah. So it was before 2001, like 2000. And they were talking about how his father like funded him to, you know, like follow those teachings and then go to Europe and find the Taliban and then join them. Nobody really knew then, but he got a turban. He grew his beard out. He had long floppy white robes. I mean, if you have people that are followers of, you know, violence, which is basically what they were portraying on the radio, then you're going to be scared of anybody that you see that looks like that. You're going to. And then what's interesting to me, though, is that Yogi Bhajan opened up the teachings now in the 90s. For, it seemed like he kept us like in a small group for a long time, and he p worked on some of us really intensely. He pressured us. He gave us like a lot of heavy tasks to do to clean our subconscious. And, I mean, I wouldn't be here if he hadn't done all that. Do you feel he was tough on you? Oh, yeah. Diets, meditations, you know, snap up, get get to it, do this work, you know. And I felt like I got trained. I was in that, like, spiritual army, if you want to call it, you know. Right. And it was, like, so cool. I mean, I wasn't ever unhappy about it. Sometimes I didn't like He gave me a milk diet for a year. I didn't know it was going to be a year. <laughs> but at seven months, I asked, can I go off of it? He's like, no, keep on it. I didn't know why. But there's a lot of things that happen because of that milk diet. And uh, he said it was for protecting my health later that I was going to get colitis or something. And, there, and then it was discipline, and it was like training your mind to be really focused. And I had so much energy on that diet. But I don't recommend that to just anybody because that was my teacher, you know, my master was guiding me, informing me. So I feel like, you know, along the way he trained us, but in the mid-90s he decided to open up the training of kundalini yoga to many people. Like he felt like, okay, the society needs it. It's got to go widespread, mm -hmm. and people are ready. Energy is ready. The energy in the universe is very different in the 90s and now than it was in the 70s. It's like so different. Can you, can you completely tell the energy, the change in compared to, uh, say, how the love revolution was back in the 60s, 70s, versus how they're saying there's a shift now that's happening and more people are opening up. Oh, yeah. It's, like, so different. I, th I felt like in the 60s, I was a little bit later than that. You know, I was, like, in the 70s when I started to become a teenager, you know, mm -hmm. right. like early 70s. And I, I felt like, um, though, there was a lot of anger, rebellion, like, like, I always think of, like, Sharon Tate and that whole thing she went through. I feel like those were people that represented what the status quo was. Wealthy, Hollywood, mm -hmm. you know, like, that's what people wanted. And then look what happened. I mean, that thing broke apart. That whole consciousness towards that, people were going, this is shallow, this is empty. At least the hippies were. And they're going, i got to find something different. So they got into drugs 
At first, they, it was kind of hedonistic, like free sex, drugs, run away from those guys, you know, your parents, all that Maya that people are into, live in like little rooms. And then, and after a while, it, it's just like, it, it was kind of draggy and icky and dirty. And people were like, oh, this isn't like what, what I'm looking for. And so then consciousness became more important. And the Beatles, you know, they went to, to India and they studied with Maharishi. And they came back and they started in their music and in their projection, like, you know, that white album? Yeah. Number nine, yeah. number nine. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> nine. Remember? Yeah. That's why I like number nine so I, much. I was in India on the anniversary, the 50th anniversary of the day I was at the Beatles ashram. Really? Oh, yeah. cool. Yeah, well, oh, that's cool. All those little pods, right? Yeah, yeah. They're like made out of stone, like these, like a bunch of little stones. They like all, you know, what I'm saying, like little. Um, yeah. They look like igloos or something like well, that. It looked like igloos. Yeah. yeah. We call them pods when we went there. I yeah. know it's cool, isn't it? Very cool. Place. And it's just deserted. It's you know what? I uh, it'd be a great. I idea. know uh, yeah, you. Yeah. You just wait. You got a lot of ideas. Yeah. One of these days you can go over and take over the world. <laughs> um. Now with now you mentioned the Beatles. Um. We always talk about this, this, this kind of transference between uh, spiritual world and pop culture and how in today's society we see that uh, the best messages come through these channels because they're the most widely received. Um, like if you have Beyonce um, doing Kundalini, um, you have the world doing Kundalini. Does so she do it? I don't think she does it, okay. but we can get her doing it. Um, <laughs> so what do you That was an invitation. <laughs> so what do you believe <laughs> is um, that bridge? And why is that bridge necessary before... Pop oh, culture. you know, I, actually, I think the biggest bridge that's going to happen is people getting really insecure and living in a lot of pain, no matter who you are. Hmm. That's what I think. Hmm. Pain is the biggest mover. And I think that people are becoming really anxious and really uncomfortable with themselves, with the world. They don't have the nervous system to be able to handle the way things are. They don't know how to change. They're really like out of it. My, I remember my landlady called me two days ago saying, there's a worker at your house, and you said you'd be there. And I was at the doctor's office. So I, I looked at my doctor, and I said, here, take the phone, and listen to her. And so then she did. She talked to her. And then she goes, my doctor's like this, uh-huh, mm-hmm, oh, yeah, mm-hmm. Oh. <laughs> For 10 minutes, she's, like, doing that. And when she hung up, I said, what did she say? And she, because she talked 10 minutes. <laughs> She goes, she just likes to talk. <laughs> and then she goes, remember how Yogi Bhajan said the world's going to fall apart before it gets better huh. and people are going to be really a mess? She goes, that's a good example. She goes, people are falling apart. She's a doctor. She sees a lot of people, you know. But I think that people are going to get so uncomfortable with the way they are that they're just going to have to find, you know, like something. And the thing is, like, what Yogi Bhajan told us is that Kundalini is really fast. He said, you can do Hatha yoga, and then you can, it's sort of like standing in L.A. and deciding, I'm going to walk to New York. And he goes, but if you get on the Kundalini flow, it's like standing in, New York, in L.A. and then getting on a jet plane and taking it to New York. Mm -hmm. It's just faster. Right. So we're lucky. I feel very, 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 very fortunate and lucky. Now, you want to talk about what you're asking is the bridge between um, Kundalini and pop culture, because we had a guest on here, Gregory Lupkin, and he um, said that a lot of actors, and a lot of performers, they empty the, themselves into their characters. And so by the time they're done with that, with, with their performance, they have to go to their vices to kind of get filled up again. Um, and if they become wide open, they're yeah, channeling. They're, they're, yeah, they're just channeling. So, they're, so, so once they empty, they're wide open for anything to come in. Um, and so discernment is especially important in that process. But um, how do you see the bridge forming between Kundalini and pop culture? Or how do you see that? When you say, like how, how do I see a bridge, what do you mean exactly? Influencing? I mean, yeah, like how does... Pop like as far as the Beatles, when they followed their, their yogi to India, you know, that they, they were a huge, huge um, t in pop culture, yeah. you know, so stuff like, thing like that. Well, I first of all, I don't think... We're in charge. Mm -hmm. I think God's in charge. Or the g we, we say ong namo, it means to that creative force. So however you look at that spirit that's kind of like running the world, that's running the universe, that's running the timing, mm -hmm. we're just kind of like little teeny, you know, things on the earth that actually are able to channel that force, and they decide how they want to put it through you. It's all timing. 
So, like, if you had people in the, you know, in the 60s, you had a few people starting to talk about consciousness on a pop level, but not many people heard it because they weren't ready. As the consciousness of people is starting to expand, and I honestly believe there is an energy that's coming through the world, that's coming through the universe, that's coming under people and lifting people up like a wind. I just believe it. Mm. And you can either get on the wind and ride it. It's like, it's like surfer dudes who like to ride the wave. Right. You can either do that or you can go, no, I'm not going to do that. You can be like not open to change, not open to expanding, not open to feeling the force because when it comes through you, it forces you to pay attention to what you're going through and who you are. Yeah. And then sometimes they'll be like, they'll go, you have to do this. You have to go serve here. You have to do on this task. And it's whether you can be open to it and not get impatient. Because a lot of people are really impatient. They're like, I got to have my destiny and do it now. <laughs> and I'm going to save the world. But it, it's a steady one by one step towards enlightenment. And you don't want to do it all at once because otherwise you become like a freaking nutcase. Right. Does that I make agree. sense? Yeah. No, totally. I, I, I so I totally. really think that if there's a, any kind of pop culture openings, it's because it's being directed by another level. Hmm. And, and I also believe <coughs> we have times when we're going to be really open and receptive and then there's going to be times when you shut down for a while and you just got to flow with it. Just like, you know, okay, so, so Joey, you were talking about the kundalini opening that you've had, yes. right? Because a lot of people are starting to experience it. And, and it's not just by ayahuasca or drugs or it's not. A lot of times people will just have things happen to them and they don't even know why. It just happens. And suddenly energy is running through them because it's their time. Now, I had an experience. May I tell you yes, one I, I had? Yes, I'd love to hear it, yeah. <coughs> so we went to India. Mm -hmm. What year was this? 90, I think it was like either 93 or 95. I think it might have been 95. But anyway, why we went twice, you know. It might have been 93 because I had my daughter in my lap and we're on a boat. And we're on this little boat in the middle of the Ganga, Mother Ganga, which I didn't ever thought was a holy river until... I've had so many things happen in that river that I thought, there's something magic there. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like, seriously. Maybe it's just because all the people go there and they pray over it and they make it holy. I don't know. That would do it. That would do <laughs> it. That would do it. It's water, you know, all changing that energy? the water. Mm -hmm. But anyway, so we were, the way it had happened, it's a funny story. Do you have time to hear it? I'd love to hear it. Okay. <laughs> so Yogi Bhajan had made the, indication I was supposed to go and take my daughter and she was three so it was probably 93 so she's like three and a half so we go to India and the lady who was in charge of the Yatra she rented two buses for us to travel all over and we hadn't been able to go to India for a while because mm. you know there had been an attack on the golden temple by the the government and they closed off India the northern India area around the Golden Temple from anyone Western. Yogi, did you have a, a heart attack at that? Like yeah, he time? he did have a heart attack when it when the attack when the attack on the Golden Temple happened. It was two years later, eighty six. Attack was in eighty four, and it was so much stress on him because he could see stuff. I mean, how would you like to see that? You know, it was a genocide, and all the Sikhs were being murdered, yeah. and he couldn't do anything about it. So I think that that whole thing was, like, super stressful. He would call India all the time, and it w it, I think it was just really hard on him. But anyway, so when it finally opened up, it was around 93. So we all went to India, like 165 people. And he said, take a sleeping bag, take a walking stick, and take a backpack. And he goes, we're going to go like pilgrims through the countryside. And we're going like, we don't take sides. We're just here for the religious, you know, download for, from the Golden Temple and from the different tuckets, you know, the thrones. He said, so that's all we're going to be like. Mm -hmm. So I had my daughter and me and two sticks and two backpacks and two, you know, sleeping bags and the kid. So I'd run up to the bus 
and there wasn't enough room on the bus, so I'd run with all my stuff, like a donkey, you know. <laughs> I'd get to the bus, and I'd stand up, and I'd look, and there's no seats. So I'd have to end up for hours sitting on the little tiny edge of a seat with my daughter. And one day, the last, it was like a Thursday after we started. We got there like Sunday. This had been going on, and I was like just getting sick of it. So I get on the bus. There's not even a seat I could sit on the edge. So I got off the bus. I just stood there with my daughter and all the stuff. And I was like, I don't care. You guys leave. I'm just going to stand here all day. I don't care. I was just mad, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so between the two, because the staff bus was in front of us, and they had 25 people. We had 160 people. It was insane. So I'm just standing there, and I'm kind of fuming. And I'm like, no, I'm not budging. I don't care anymore. And I look between the two buses, and I see this bubble Mercedes, really old, kind of cool. Yogi Bus is standing there, and he's cocking his head like, come over here. I'm like, no, hmm. no, no. Not, I'm not budging. I'm mad. So then a lady came running up to me, and she goes, Yogi Bush wants you to come get in his car. He's giving you his car for the day. And I'm like, what? <laughs> <laughs> she goes, come on, come on. She grabbed me. And so we ran over, and the car was empty. There was a driver, so we put all the stuff in the trunk. And me and my daughter and, and my ex-husband were all sitting in the back seat. And she sat in front. That She just wanted to come with us and get a ride. <laughs> so we drove all the way to Rishikesh. And we got there like hours before anybody else. And we put our stuff in some room. They have cots, you know, that they let you sleep in a room. And then we stood by the river. And then a boat comes up. And it was like the guys are talking in Hindi, and they go, get on. And we're like, uh, okay. <laughs> so then all of a sudden the bus shows up, and all the people like come pouring out of the bus, and they all get on that one boat. Now, it, the boat wouldn't move. It sunk. It was so heavy with all the people that it sunk into the sand. And they're trying to move it out, but it wouldn't move. And Yogi Bhajan's on it, and then Swamiji's on it, and all the people. And so then they bring another boat up. But nobody would get off the first boat because Yogi Bhajan was on it. <laughs> and so I looked at my ex-husband. I said, let's just get on the other boat. This is ridiculous. So we got on the other boat. 25 people joined us, and then they moved us out to the middle of the Ganga. So we're just sitting there, and the sun's going down. It's really peaceful. It's so beautiful. I'm holding my daughter. And all of a sudden, I look over, and there's that other boat. Somehow they kicked enough people off. <laughs> And it's right next to ours. And then they start chanting. And it's a really high mantra, and it was really beautiful. And they start chanting, Wahe Guru. And I was just sitting there half asleep because, you know, we didn't have much sleep. And I'm holding my daughter. I'm chanting. And then I go really quiet, really still. And then all of a sudden, the entire love of the universe came out of the blue, pouring into my heart center. Talk about energy. It was so, so burning and intense and hot, and yet at the same time so beautiful and so magical and so white and so, like, perfect. And I was frozen. I couldn't move. I had my arms around my daughter, and I was thinking, I hope I don't drop her. And then I realized I can't move, so she's fine. <laughs> so that went on for 15 minutes. Can you imagine? It's almost like it cleared all the the insecurities out of my heart center and it cleared off a lot of the pain it just burnt everything away so then after about 15 minutes they stopped chanting and they decided to take the boats back into the shore back to where the ashram was so w i could barely let go of my daughter but i untwined her and i gave them to Hari Jiwan. and then somehow i got off the boat i could barely walk but we got into the room and they went right to sleep because they, they gave us like that night five hours to sleep, which was shocking because most nights were like two hours. So it was a pure black room. I got them in, in bed. I cleared up all the stuff, I, you know, our luggage and all that. I laid down. I closed my eyes. Bright white light. I couldn't, I couldn't sleep. Every time I closed my eyes, it was like pulsating white light. And I thought, weird. I, I was, like, so, like, kind of mad because we finally get time to sleep, and here I am, like, I have to open my eyes because otherwise it's so, so white. So that went on for hours, and then finally they let us, you know, wake up, and then I was like, okay, here we go again. So when I went back to the U.S., what I found was something had been instilled in my auric field. 
It was a new energy of the heart, and it was of love, and it was vibrating so strong that any person I'd go near, they would come up to me, get hypnotized, and then they, they want to tell me their deepest, darkest secrets. I had it happen so many times. I went to buy a garage door one day. I walk in. I hadn't been in that store like more than two seconds. A lady comes over to me. She goes, oh, I have to tell you. She goes, I ran up Mulholland Drive and ran over a guy and I killed him. I didn't mean to, but he was a little gardener and he was running across the street and now I feel so guilty and I can't sleep and I, I started drinking and now I'm an alcoholic and I'm wrecking my family. What should I do? And all I could do was listen to her and then have compassion and the, poor, the force was coming through me. It was going into her. And I said, well, maybe you need to do this meditation. I gave her a meditation and I said, I just really want to buy a garage door. <laughs> <laughs> but it started happening so many times that I had to learn how to take the energy and hold it and mm -hmm. pull it back so it wasn't always there all the time because it was everywhere. Grocery stores, in line at Target. I mean, it didn't matter where I was. I wouldn't even look at the person and they would like tell me stuff. <laughs> They'd just come up and hit me on the back and go, listen, I got to tell you something. And I thought, this is not acceptable people were telling me stuff in meetings you know huh. can you imagine <laughs> wow now now how did you know hearing your awakening moments um and then understanding joys um how did you meet joy like what connected you to joy okay so first of all in the middle of all this if you're on a spiritual path you should know that things are going to happen energy is going to unfold and you can't freak out. Why is it that, that most religions don't tell you that there's an energy component to because spirituality? Because we've been in the Piscean age. And most people, except for people like the Buddha or Jesus Christ when he was on the, the cross, mm -hmm. they haven't had the openings. It just hasn't happened yet. It's like there's been knots tied up. And, and the whole thing's been run by the dark force. You feel something's coming or something? Oh, yeah, shift? the light force is coming definitely. It's so much different. It's so much easier to meditate. It's so much easier to talk to people and they hear you. It's amazing the difference. It's in the culture, it's in the billboards, it's in songs, it's in people's speech, and it's going to get more. But Yogi Bhajan had predicted that when the white energy, the light energy, the golden energy is dawning, there's a fight between the dark and the light. He called it the gray period. So there are going to be a lot of people that, in the middle of all this, they get mixed up, they get depressed, they don't know what to do, they're anxious, and you went through that. Those are, I think, yeah, that's what we were going to talk to you about is the actual symptoms that an awakening has. A kundalini awakening has actual symptoms that are usually confused with schizophrenia. depression, schizophrenia, mm -hmm. and a lot of things that we hear about when you go to the doctor, but things that I feel that, from my uh, experience, they weren't... They weren't equipped to give me uh, a diagnosis of is what I had. So they said I had schizophrenia because of the fact that this was an energy-based symptom. They had no idea what to do. Well, I mean, in your, in your case, in the case of a lot of people that haven't really prepared, like I was lucky because I studied with Yogi Bhajan since I was about 18 and a half, and he, he in a way prepared me. Like he had us doing the kundalini yoga. We got our nervous system really strong. I experienced little bits of opening all the way through for years, for decades, you know, so that when the major, that major one on the Ganga, that was huge. I wasn't shocked. I was like, okay, this is a new thing. I'd never seen anything like this before, but I didn't freak out because I was like, I have a reference point. Mm -hmm. And I also had a nervous system and a body that was prepared to hold it. Like, it's kind of like if you have a glass, and then if it's got a crack in it, because the nervous system is weak, or let's say it's thin and it can't really hold the energy, you're going to have problems. Do you feel that people get confused with uh, mental illness and spirituality? Well, I mean, Yogi Bhajan did say, he goes, lunatics, philosophers, and lovers are all the same. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. That's very true. <laughs> but but I, I think that, first of all, if you, I mean, there's like different things that happen. There are, what is schizophrenia? Why do people, you know, what is bipolar? Mm -hmm. You know, you, you got to think like this. 
he was talking in this lecture one day, and he said, if one eyebrow is a little teeny bit higher than another eyebrow, he goes, it means that there's something in the hemispheres of the brain that's, that's off and isn't connecting. And so you think, well, what can you do about that? <laughs> well, I think there's two hemispheres of the brain that the neurons, they fire back and forth, and if you're balanced, you hear the information, you can be very intuitive. And if they're not, you can be mixed up. And if you've been through a lot of insecurity and violence in your life or just a lot of trouble, the, the, there will be a split in the hemispheres and they can't communicate. So that's why we have meditations. Yogi Bhajan gave so many meditations and yoga sets. Like even this morning I taught, you know, balancing the left and the right hemispheres of the brain. It's published. It's like there. Then I taught a meditation that, the whole thing was for balancing the brain and balancing the energy in the body. Like we don't, you know, we, I remember growing up in the 60s, 70s, you know, we were like, we want to be different. And I think it's true now with teenagers and young adults. We want to be different. We want to be on our own, like that whole rebellion thing, mm -hmm. the anger. Well, you got to think about it. You can be balanced and you can be great. You can be balanced and you can be so high and you can help understand and run the energy through you to give it to other people. But you got to prepare the body. And I think Kundalini Yoga really prepares the body. But you got to get to a point where don't freak out. Mm. Just observe. You're under the auspices of a master. And he was under the auspices of his master. And ultimately, the force in the heavens is Guru Ramdas, who's known as the sage for the age of Aquarius. And he creates miracles, and he brings healing. So we always do all of our yoga classes, and we do all our ashrams in honor of that healing that comes from Guru Ramdas. Very compassionate, very loving. He lived in about the 1500s. And so I think that, you know, you just have to understand there's going to be energy changes, and just go with them rather than try to fight them. Try to understand them. Right. I yeah. think for when that, when going through it, um, not, I guess I, you know what it was, is I didn't want to fight because it felt so good to me, but I knew that it was freaking my family out. And I knew that making that decision, it was when I went to New Mexico, you said you need to go to New Mexico and it was right around father's day. I think it was around the 18th. And I remember that day very well because I knew at that point in time that there was no going back, that, that I made a decision to, to follow what I felt was real. Well, wouldn't, wouldn't you say that what you went through, you had energy surging through you, right? And yeah. your body wasn't quite ready for it? No, not at all. I, I mean, and not at all. your mind wasn't ready for it? No. I, I, I mean, I guess it was ready or wouldn't happen. I, I don't ha know how to answer that because it happened so quickly. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't know what it was. So the way I, I knew the world, I knew it the way I woke up every day. I didn't, you know, people talk about people in other realms talking in movies. There's life after death. I don't, you, you, it was all a movie to me or an MTV video. It, did, it wasn't real. But the day I woke up and I was able to hear that, that changed everything. I, you, I, could, I wanted to give everything away because I, my whole life I've been chasing money. My dad said before I, he died, he said, money is your God. And at the time it didn't bother me. But after he died, it was like a loop in my head and it kept playing over and over. And all of a sudden when I was able to see behind that veil, hear and feel, it changed my perception of everything, what I wanted to do, how I wanted to treat other people, and actually how I looked at myself, how I used to be, and what I wanted to, wh how I wanted to be different, because I started to see things differently. It opened up. Do you want to say what your, uh, your emotional experience was when it started happening and how it first happened? I think I think that's important for people to know. It happens differently for different people. Mm -hmm. I, it, because of the way I am, I was a I was grew up on the streets, and I'm not gonna say I was a man's man, but you know, I I was definitely Damn. a street dude, tough guy. So tough yeah. guy. So I didn't. What happened was, is I started getting very emotional, but I would hide it. So I'd go to my car and I start crying. <laughs> I start crying <laughs> in my car. And as soon as I got home, I'd quit crying and I'd hide it and I'd walk in. I go, "Hey, what's going on?" And, <laughs> and I didn't tell anybody for a while, but I just I didn't know what was happening. So I finally. Do you want to say what you, what the feelings were, what you felt, and how you felt? Yeah, why were you crying? It's almost like a. 
it's a euphoric feeling of almost bliss. Like it's hard to explain. Like like the tree, the colors of trees, the color of the sky, everything was crispy, everything was bright, vibrant. Like uh, when people spoke to me, the color I, I stopped wearing certain colors because I didn't want to intimidate people, which was weird. So I started. I was shaking everyone's hand. I'd smile at everybody, I, and I didn't know why I was doing it. I started to feel like I think I wonder if I'm gay. You know, <laughs> I don't. Know. <laughs> I started just acting in ways that I wasn't acting before. Very simple. So as I started to get more used to it, but in the middle of it, I started to hear someone speaking to me, my best friend. And that's, I tried to, the best of my ability, because I started to think at that point in time, wait a minute, I think I'm going to die. I got it. That's what it is, because why would somebody that's not here going to talk to me? So I'm probably going to die. I'm going to drive my truck off a cliff. Your or best friend that was dead. Yeah. yeah. So he came back and started communicating with me, and then, which led me to meeting a friend, uh, Eddie, who was studying Kundalini Yoga, and who brought me to you. <laughs> and I went to him at the time. Nobody was listening to me. They said, he's crazy. I've been in mental institutions and I didn't feel crazy. I know I was saying crazy things and it felt very, it felt amazing. But I, and I think because the more amazing it felt, I was trying to convince people that I wasn't crazy and it made me look crazy. Yeah. Right. So I couldn't get anywhere with anyone. And I was seeing you at the time and going to mental institutions. I was even going to rehabs because at the time I was uh, ingesting marijuana and so, sh which I didn't think you did, went to rehab for marijuana, but I would do anything to go home at the time. Which, by the way, at that point was not legal. It wasn't legal at the time. It, w it, it, it was relaxing me because I didn't understand what was happening. I wasn't drinking. I'm not saying it was right or wrong, but it was when she, when they took my blood test, the only thing they found in my system was uh, THC. Um, so I agreed. I said, yeah, I'll, I'll go to, I'll go to the re, I'll do anything. I want to go home. Mm -hmm. But I, but I, I, it still was, I. I couldn't lie about it. So she said, do you still hear, are you talking? Are you still hearing these things? I said, it's not only I'm hearing it, I feel it. It's a feeling. I get a warm feeling over my body, and out of nowhere, I start getting goosebumps all over my arms, and it just started happening more and more often. Um, and at first, it was easy to kind of, I guess they contain, but the more it, the, the more it came on, the more I w it was intoxicating. I wanted to keep being there, so I'd wake up at 3 in the morning and start meditating every day, and I never meditated before in my life. Um, and so she, at first it was okay, but then when it became to where she said I was meditating for four or five, six hours at a time, I wouldn't leave the shower because I was always in that, that I call it that space That's between, I was in the ethers and in, in the communicating. By the way, uh, what he means is he was meditating in the shower. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's an important point. Yeah. <laughs> They're like, why are you in the shower? And, and, and I built that house and built this huge shower it was like at least 10 by 10 foot maybe much bigger than that 15 by 15 it had a seat in it like you Huge, could sit it had down. an alternate oh. i built an all like i built this like i guess i knew what i was my soul knew what i was doing but you i built didn't know. altar in your in shower a, a like it was a 10 foot long altar along uh -huh. the whole back room yeah that's cool. Uh, that cool and so i would go in there and and they would just leave me alone but you know like she said she'd see me running around and talking because i'd start seeing past lives and so by the time i saw you i i was I didn't know what was real or not real anymore, to tell you the truth. I was confused. Um, I was nervous. I wanted to go home. And I didn't know what was happening to me. I was very and confused. And I think the way I handled it was really uh, the best way possible. Because I said to um, Joey, he says, I'm hearing voices. My best friend died of a drug overdose. And my wife's ex-father uh, had died. And yeah. she, he goes, I'm hearing them talking to me constantly. And I said, okay, so we have a, and he wasn't like stable. He was like walking around the living room like a wild animal. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, serious, like it a haunted, haunted person. And so I said, sit down. And I said, now, if you have an opening to the other realms, why don't we go to something, an energy field that will take you, that will make you safe and take you to a higher realm. And so then I introduced him to Yogi Bhajan, the master of Kundalini Yoga, and and he didn't really know any of these things. No. And then Guru Ram Das, and I said, every time you close your eyes and you are starting to hear Joe, the the guy that died, I said, go to Guru Ram Das, go to Yogi Bhajan, and ask them to talk to you instead. And so then we gave him a picture of uh, Yogi Bhajan, the tantric picture. There's a tantric picture that you can look in the eyes and it will talk to you. It's very, it's uh, amazing, the gifts that Yogi Bhajan left for us. And uh, unfortunately, Joey put it in his car 
and he would drive staring at it. And I said, Joey, don't stare at it while you're driving. <laughs> <laughs> at the house when she gave it to me, because I didn't, at the time, I didn't know who he was. Mm-hmm. And I remember when she handed me the, the, it was a magnet. It was a magnet, the Traticum. And I looked at it, but I wasn't, you know, I was kind of just like, I was moving so quickly. And so I grabbed it and I, it just stopped me in my tracks and out of nowhere. And I looked and I know I could see, like, I just stared at the eyes. And your back was to me. You stood and turned. I was looking. All of a sudden, I felt his beard on my face. Do you remember that? And I was like, <gasps> I'm like, what is that? What is that feeling? And all of a sudden, it was from there. That, then it was over. Because I left her house. I felt his beard on my face. And I, so I was like, uh, that had me tripping. I bet. Big time. I bet. I went home. I woke up at 3 in the morning that, that day, or that night, went in to do my meditation and then he was in my shower, like at that time. And it was from that time on, I was just, I had sat there and I, I couldn't run from him. He was talking in my head. So I said, well, I'll just talk back to him. And so I started having communication with him and it was just like I'm having a conversation with you. And mm-hmm. so I would go back and I would tell Tage of these, this communication I would have because I had to start hiding it because they were trying to have Families, me committed. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but it felt so real, and that was the first person she was listening to me, and, and, and she felt, I felt she was out to protect me. So, like, I had no one, and I, I just, whatever she told me to do, I did. And at the time, I, it seemed, because when you're in it, you, it doesn't feel, you feel normal. I, I didn't realize how, some I was doing a lot of crazy things, because I, I was seeing past lives. I, I had this, I had to have swords around me everywhere. So that freaked people out. But I wasn't like I was swinging them at people. But I had them under my bed. I had swords everywhere. Um, I just didn't. It didn't. It didn't hit me because then it became normal, mm-hmm. right? So then I had to just to kind of hide it. So I started trying to find ways to hide it. And then what happened was, I, I think uh, it was probably a month and a half later, and I went back to my to my house. I was living by myself because she wouldn't let me at the house. And then I had an episode to where I felt this vibration, a circular vibration, come into my chest. It was about four in the afternoon. But I could feel it knew exactly. It was different than Yogi G's vibration. And I got up and I knew, and it was Trumpa Rumpache. And that mo- I get up the next day, I had to see her. Whenever things like that would happen, I'd, I had to see her immediately because I had to get that off of like what that was and help process the information. And she would yeah. always help me with that. So when I went and I told her that I was speaking to someone else, that's, you sent me, that's when I went to uh, Spain with Hari Jeevan. You said, you need to go talk to Hari Jeevan now. And I was like, okay. And uh, I went to... Well, I think the important point here is that there are different spiritual lines of communication from a very high, high place. And they've come on the earth in different formats, Mm -hmm. you know? Jesus, Buddha, the different lamas, you know, the Dalai Lama, all holding space of different parts of the realm of high grace and goodness. Mm -hmm. And... (laughs) I was laughing so hard because one day, and, and, and it, it's starting to activate in people so that they can bring the energy here. But I was laughing one day because Joey goes to me, he was still living with his home with his wife and he's in the bedroom and it's like two in the morning. He jumps up and he starts running around <laughs> the room. And what did you go there? I was screaming. Uh, well, he was, he what, what happened were you was, screaming? but what were you screaming? I was, I was like running around. Coming, the b- no, I was no, screaming you. peace and love. Oh yeah. He was screaming peace, love. <laughs> so what happened was I woke up and I woke up and I thought there was going to be an earthquake. So yeah. I, I felt like a, a, some kind of something shaking and yeah. I, and I, I looked at JC and I go, what is that? And she looked at me like, what are you talking about? And so when she looked at me like that, so I kept it to myself. So at that time, I felt something like a, a, a very sh- like strong vibration coming. So I didn't know what it was. So I st- started to run in the room in circles. It's a, so I was running in wor- with my finger up saying, peace and love, peace and love. Didn't think anything. I thought I was going to die. I didn't know what yeah. it was, but it was so strong, but it was coming inside my, within my body. So I mm. went and I hid under my pillows thinking it was going to go away, and it didn't. And so about maybe 20 minutes... And now it's about three three fifteen in the morning. I go to the shower, and something. I lay down in the shower, and then that vibration that I thought was strong intensified by about a hundred. It felt like a helicopter landed in my chest. It was like a, I couldn't even explain it. It was like such a strong vibration in my chest. I couldn't like, I couldn't handle. It. I, I laid down flat, and when I laid down flat in the shower, when I did that, I could kind of feel him lay over my body. And when I did that, I could see his skin over my 
my like his derm like over my body and i remember i got up and i started walking around and stretching my jaw and i didn't understand what was happening i remember i jumped on the ground like i was trying to like i don't know like to balance or mm-hmm. i didn't know what it was that happened at this time now she's now looking she's spying on me and the things i'm doing because now i'm like acting it out because my mind is trying to i guess figure out what's happening make in the sense best of it yeah, process yeah the yeah. process it the way my mind is because it hasn't ever been in something like this so a lot of the times I'd look up to talk because I would just think they were up to my right for whatever reason. And I just acted out the way I think that my mind associated with however it was going to play it out. Mm-hmm. And so I was slowly able to start bringing that down to a minimum because a lot of it, I'd start doing hand mudras, which I'd never done a hand mudra in my life. <laughs> I didn't know what mudra meant. But I would do them, and when I did, I would get totally comfortable. I'd get bumps and chills all over my arms, and I'd start seeing these images. And then JC would go, what are you doing? And I didn't know what I was doing. So I didn't know how to, even what to say. So I just started sitting on my hands. And I used to have to hide it. And I remember, you know, I would go to Tej and I, I, I it got to a point to where I didn't want to hide it. I wanted to embrace, embrace it. it. Yeah, yeah. I f- it was a, probably the most amazing thing that's ever happened to me. I started feeding homeless people. I wanted to help the world. I wanted, I just felt like somebody showed me something that I wish I saw a long time ago. Or at least somebody would have and, like and introduced me to and it's interesting because um, I uh, I taught a yoga class uh, at Wonderlust Festival in Seattle this past weekend. And in Washington, state of Washington, they're working on doing a project where they are replacing parole officers with yogis. Or they're really bringing um, the yoga community into the prisons, um, which has been happening for a while. But they're really doing a great job of it because at the end of my class, I do a sharing circle. And one of the guys got up, and he was actually a former felon. And he spoke about the fact that he has come to his own awakening through the process of yoga. Um, and his yogi was there. And he stood up and he was crying and she stood up. And it kind of, it, it, it showed me this moment of what we really do need. Um, and so, Tej, I would love to ask you, you know, what do you think of Kundalini involving uh, or involved in prisons and involved in school? I mean, do you think that that is something that can help, um, help us grow and flourish as humans? Yeah, I mean, there's something I want to address. When, when you're born in the human body, in this Piscean age going into the Aquarian age, and in the Piscean age, Yogi Bhajan explained to us that we have different locks, buns. The energy is locked in different places in the body. And the first lock is at the rectum sex organs navel area. And it's like the lower chakra energy is stuck. And then there's another lock that's at the heart where it's locked there. And then you go to the third eye point and there's another lock. So what happens with the kundalini energy is it gets loosened, it gets moving through your body and it does healing on the organs, makes you have more vitality. And these are, I'm not just saying this as words, I mean it's real. And then as the buns, the locks, get broken open, because it happened to me when I was in that yoga for, as a form of therapy class, <laughs> <laughs> where the guy had us, that same guy, you know, he turned out to be a lawyer. I was shocked. He had us standing up, raising our arms over our head, palm to palm, and then we leaned back as far as we could, and we held it. And we held it for like four or five minutes, breathing. And now in the middle of that, I feel this something in the base of my spine go clunk. I mean, it was like really loud. And then this energy game went running through my body, all through the body, which wasn't prepared yet because I was a, I drank 10 cups of coffee a day. I was a, I was a college student. I studied. And so all of a sudden we could sit down and my whole body was vibrating and shaking and I was crying. My hands were shaking. And I went up to the teacher later, and I said, what's going on? I can't, like, I can't be still. And he said, oh, <laughs> this is that same guy. Oh, yes. Sometimes the energy will, kundalini will open through the body. Just lie down. And then he called three of Yogi Bhajan's secretaries out. One of them started rubbing the bottom of my feet. One of them started rubbing the top of my head. And the other one went to my navel and was about, balancing the energy there in a circle. So suddenly all the shaking got stretched out through the body, all the energy got peaceful, 
and I could just sit there, and I was fine. I got up and I left. If everybody knew how to do that, that would be so great because there's going to be more people having kundalini openings. Now, as far as, like, the whole experience of the buns, the locks, when the energy stuck in the first, second, and third chakra, you're very reactive, you're greedy, you're aggressive, you get angry really easily, you want everything for yourself. You see the world as not a friendly place. That's what can be unlocked. Then you move the energy to the heart center, and then where you were attached before, like, I got to have this guy to be okay with me as my lover. He has to be my husband. He has to be my friend. Um, I need to have this food to be okay. You know, it's like like suddenly, like, the love part, though, opens up, but you're very attached. It's almost like, can look at, like, a lotus that's facing downwards. And then when you do the kundalini yoga, it can turn it, the lotus up, so it's reflecting the energy of love of, the, of Christ, of the universe. Then when you move the energy up to the third eye point, people before it's open, they think they know, they're psychic, they see everything, but they don't really know. When that bund is open, then suddenly you know stuff, you understand the universe and its timing, its flow, and suddenly you're, you're not you, you're just a flow. You're like a servant of the universe. So I think that, like, for example, when you have people that have been in the prison or they've done crimes, they've had the first, second, and third chakras locked, and maybe they had a lot of grief in the heart. Mm -hmm. So as we turn the energy around so that it flows through the body, it heals some of these pain issues that people have gone through, breaks open the lock from the bottom so they don't feel so scared all the time, they don't feel so alone, moves it into the heart where you can experience real love. And then if you're lucky, very few people get to the point where they take the third eye and they open that to the point that they just are surrendering to seeing and serving. So I think it's, it's good to help everybody. You know, the kids in the schools can then grow up better. The people in the prisons can, like, forgive themselves mm -hmm. and then start to, what's that thing do when you... Re rehabilitate yeah rehabilitate just through their own consciousness and they don't have to like have somebody telling them what to do or they're angry about it they can just start to hear and feel and rehabilitate through their own intentions which is always the best isn't it yeah it is and 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 just to clarify i mean guys i've i've taken um Tage's class before um it was one of the first classes that i've kind of partaking, partaking when I got here originally in L.A. And, uh, yeah, a brother was on his mat crying within, like, uh, about 10 minutes, uh, even less than that. Um, and I found myself in a state of, uh, of bliss. And I found myself in that state after every class. Um, so first and foremost, I want to thank you, Tate, for just um, guiding us or, and, and guiding me in ways that I didn't know was possible and opened me up because – I, I mean, I will keep repeating this, man. The last nine months of my life have been very transformational in um, my heart space. Um, I'm a lot more loving uh, and a lot more forgiving of myself nowadays, thanks to practicing yoga with Joey and thanks to just experiencing what he's experienced and seeing myself in him. Because at the end of the day, we are all mirrors, and uh, I've truly been able to see that through this experience. Um, now, here's my real question. And, um, <laughs> uh, you know, I, I've, I've, I've taken a lot of yoga um, and I find that Kundalini um, is, and, and the yoga's changed a lot as far as yoga was at one point only for men, and then it became uh, available to everyone. And now I find in yoga world, because I work in a lot of festivals for wellness, um, you don't see a lot of men um, in these spaces. Uh, you see that it, it, to me, it's kind of, it's kind of tipped. It's like 75, 25 some places. Okay, so I'm going to answer that. May I? Yeah, you can. Please, please, okay. please. When Yogi Bhajan first started this whole practice in the West, mm -hmm. he mainly had men that were trying to be like him. Mm -hmm. And they were like, you know, younger men, like 18, 21, early 20s. And they were like trying to be like, you know, like the macho. big macho yogi guy. Really, like, it was kind of an image of a spiritual man, and they talked big, but there was still so much ego going on. Then after a while, Yogi Bhajan said, in the Aquarian age, women will rule, 
Women will have the most effect in families, over children, over the society, in offices. The energy of women is really, really powerful. And he said, I have to start helping them because during the Piscean Age, women were really trashed a lot. Mm -hmm. I mean, there was even a, a story he told about a lady walked up to him and said, look at this belt I got, it's rope. She says, I just got it on Melrose. And she was trying to impress him. And he goes, are you kidding? He goes, in the Celtic times, women had ropes around them, along with, with cattle and sheep, and they were sold in the market at auction, and you want to go put that back on? He got really mad at her. I think, I don't know if she threw it away. I would have. <laughs> mm. But he started women's camps where he, in the summer, he would have the women come together, sleep in tents, and then he would lecture. And then the women in company of other women, it's very healing for each other. Yeah. He put them on diets and exercise programs, and then he just let them go at it. And they worked out a lot of their stuff. And it went on, you know, up until the 2000s, and they still have it, but he, d he isn't there physically anymore because he died in 2005. But he, as that time came on and women got more balanced, I've been watching now as the Kundalini Yoga has gotten out into the public that more men are starting to feel comfortable coming to it because mm -hmm. men are starting to understand that they're sensitive beings too. Mm -hmm. And to be strong, it's not like Mad Men in the 60s, that show you know people mm -hmm. would watch. It's not like that anymore for men. And men's identity is kind of confused right now. And so they have to find a place where they can discover who they are with respect and then know how to be strong in their sensitivity. And I feel like Kundalini Yoga allows for that. Does that make sense? Oh, yes. no, it makes Absolutely. perfect, perfect, perfect sense. The other sense. thing is I have a really strong opinion about something, if you don't mind. No, please. That because women were injured in the Piscean Age, when they had children that were little boys, like women have, little, boy, little girls have access to both sides of their brain. Both hemispheres are awake. Mm -hmm. With, and Yogi Bhajan said that's because the intuition has to be stronger so that they're able to take care of their children and know what's going on in the house and, like, answer the phone, cook the dinner, hold the baby, you know, do all those things at once. He said men only have one side of their brain activated because they're, they were hunters traditionally, and they had to go out into the world and hunt and produce stuff. So, unfortunately, he said women can repair themselves, but men can't. Hmm. So he said, what ha I feel like what happened is when a little boy was born, he was a baby, and everything was the goddess, the mother. I mean, she was like everything to him. And then in the imbalanced emotional state that women have been in, brought up in, and also because they've been trashed by men in that time period, I don't think it's going to be that way in the future, Hashtag Me Too movement is changing stuff. But little boys, when they got talked to harshly from the mother, like she would take her stuff out on the little kid, and then there's an injury that he just hasn't been able to get over. And I think that the kundalini energy can help repair for men so they can heal and then take responsibility for who they are and then direct their lives better. Does that make sense? Yes. That makes perfect sense. I think it's sense. beautiful for men. I think it's just so, so touching that men have had to go through what they had to go through and women had to go through what they had to go through. And now we have a tool that can really open up people to their sensitive side and let them be strong in their spirit, in their love for themselves. And when you have that energy of love for yourself, it doesn't matter what anybody else thinks about you doesn't matter, you know, how your life is changing with your family like you went through. You just go, all right, God's running the show. I'm in alignment with my soul development. Let's see, and listen. And, like, instead of freaking out, like, he has all these things on the, the board here, what happens when people have kundalini openings, like hallucinations, confusion, chills, itching skin. Have you read this before? Yeah. Mm -hmm. The I've twitches, the heat, the racing heart, tingling. You know, pain. You get pain through your body, and then sometimes your muscles cramp up. You have seizures. That, right? I'd see like, well, I, I call them seizures, but my body would go into 
would start going to spasms. Like and cramping, yeah. But, but sp- you know, my arms would go the wrong way as it would spin, you know. What's, what's interesting is I see ears ringing. Man, my ears been ringing for like, I don't know, like a month. A little soft, like it'll come up and go, but like well, it's Well, okay, so when the kundalini energy starts to rise up, the jalunder bun, the neck lock is super important because if you hold your neck like this, yeah. the energy will come up behind the ears and then you'll get nauseous, you'll have ringing, you'll get yeah. dizzy, you want you fall over. So it's really important to keep this neck channel open through neck rolls, mm-hmm. cobra pose, you know, just in meditation, sit tall and let the energy rise up into the head, into the top of the head, the 10th gate and let it go out to the aura. It's so important. People don't get that. Like in a lot of traditions, they say there's seven chakras. But in Kundalini, they say there's eight chakras. The last one is the aura. So that it's rectum, sex organs, navel, heart, center, throat, third eye point, and then the top of the head that makes seven. And then out through the top of the head around your body is the aura. And Yogi Bhajan told us, he goes, in many traditions, they don't know that the energy has to go up and then go into the aura and feed it. It's your connection. Mm. It's your connection to growth into infinity. So sometimes the sets will keep the energy in the body to heal it, and the other times they'll, it'll, the yoga kriyas will open up your third eye. Sometimes they'll open up into your aura and let you connect. But if you have too much energy in your body, it can spasm you. And that's why he said sometimes he'll put dancing in there, at the end of the class, and people will just like, oh, I don't want to do it, forget it. You got to do it. You got to move. You got to move the energy through the body, through the aura, connect. Dancing's really important. Oh, right? I, I, I incorporate dancing in my class uh, as like, uh, I force people to dance basically. And it's very uncomfortable for them because they're dancing in the eyes of strangers and they get weird. But I see a moment shift within like a minute or two where they actually close their eyes and they find themselves in like an ecstatic moment. And like they feel almost like connected to everyone in the room. And then they open their eyes again, and I see that light. Like I see that glimmer in their eyes. And that's the same thing I see when I take your class. That's the same thing I've seen in Kundalini. And it's important to me because growing up, I didn't have an access point for some of this knowledge because when you're growing up in the city or you're raised in an urban environment, um, some of these things are just hidden. I wouldn't say hidden. Um, they're just... They're not, not as discussed. accessible. They're not as accessible. And they're not. They're just not discussed. Um, there's all these other things that are discussed. Um, so I am actually proud of myself um, for continuing to educate myself on um, yoga, and not necessarily just yoga, but also Kundalini. And thank you, Joey, um, for inviting that into my life because I'm telling you guys, world, Kundalini is coming. Um, it's and, here, and it, it, yeah, it's been here. But yeah. the okay, so sometimes people think that Kundalini energy opening is dangerous, mm-hmm. and I want to address that. Please do. You know, as a uh, you know, my teacher as a master, he told us, he said, if you handle the energy right, don't change the teachings, follow them as they were laid out by the master, mm-hmm. you'll be fine. Mm-hmm. If you try to change it, you're dealing with the energy of the atomic bomb, and mm. it can burn you, fry you, blow things up. So he gave us kundalini yoga, and he said, when you first start, you put your hands together, and you close your eyes, and you meditate on the high realms, and you chant the mantra, Om Namo, Guru Dev Namo, because it will connect you to that realm that's here to heal us and direct us. Let's do it one time to show people. Inhale. Oh. Um. Usually we do it at the beginning of a class, uh, beginning of doing a practice. Sometimes people do it before meetings. But you'll do it like three to five times, and it, it ch- it's like a protective device that channels the energy unto infinity so it doesn't get lost in your body and fry you. Mm. Okay? Mm. All right, so... The second thing is he gave certain yoga kriyas that are, kriya is a balanced set of exercises that's laid out 
in a certain pattern, like number one, then number two, <laughs> then number three. I once was teaching a teacher training course, and the people were doing a practicum. They were like, yeah, we're doing a yoga set, and they were getting graded for it. That was part of the, the training. So there was a lawyer there, and he, everybody has their book. They know. He, he goes, do this exercise, number two, then number seven, then number three, then number five, then number one. And everyone was just staring at him, but they did it because, you know, they were trying to be polite. And at the end of it, when I had time to comment, I said to him, you're a lawyer, right? He goes, yes, I am. I go, you know how to count. <laughs> yes, I do. And I go, you're educated, right? Yes, I am. I said, then why the hell did you do it like that? <laughs> you're supposed to do it in sequence. <laughs> I laid into him. And then later, a guy went up to him and said, oh, you must be really embarrassed. And the guy goes, no, the lawyer. He goes, I'm not. He goes, I know why she did it. And she's right. And the next day, he wrote a haiku and brought it to me as a gift. Isn't that interesting? Because he knew. See, the thing is, like, the, the yoga exercises, they have to be done in the sequence the master gave them. That's why I'm always really, as an archivist, I try to keep everything as pure, right to the teachings as the master laid them out. Because he knows stuff that I don't know. He knows how energy needs to move, and you don't want to mess around with it. So if he tells you to do it, this exercise for three minutes, you can do it three minutes or less, never more. And do it in the sequence, follow it through, and if you don't want to do all the exercises, do them at least for like 30 seconds. But make sure that you follow the energy pattern as laid out by the master that could see energy form and he knew how it needed to, to move in you so that you could grow in consciousness and not get messed up. Okay? Right. Okay. Okay. <laughs> um, I'm so happy I could tell you that. Oh, oh, no. I'm happy that we were able to have you on today. Yeah. Thank um, you so much for everything. You guys are doing a great job. Oh, thank you so much, Tage. Uh, well, that, I think that's a perfect way to end the show. Uh, yeah, if, if I just want to say Joey is like great now. He's getting stable and focused and mm -hmm. calm and he's not reactionary and he's getting really like linked into his high destiny and he's like taking things step by step, moving in projects that will help the world. He's doing great. And then this one, the, if you could see him, the smile on his face, <laughs> it lights up a room. <laughs> it's so cute. So I think you guys are doing great. And all your team seems to be really happy and mellow, and they're working together. So congratulations. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much. Um, <laughs> well, that, well, that is uh, all we have today. Um, thank you for showing up today, Tage, and giving us all of the wisdom that you have. Um, thank you, Joey, uh, for creating all of this for us to experience. And I uh, thank myself for being here. Thank <laughs> um, you. Thank you. I love you, Tage. I love, love you, you with all my heart. Oh. All right. Satnam. Satnam. Thank <laughs> you.